All right, this is chapter seven, administering a secure network. It's a little bit shorter chapter. We're going to talk a little bit more about protocol, protocols and TCP IP in general in this chapter. Okay. Um, do everybody know what protocols are, first of all? Okay. It's basically a set of rules. It's like English. English is a language that we speak. Well, protocols tell us how to communicate. It's rules. TCP IP is the most common. Is that the most, is it the fastest? What do you think? No, actually, it's not. It's actually quite slow. IPX SPX is a much faster <laughs> protocol, but it's not the standard. So TCP IP is the standard. Does anyone remember back when Novell actually used IPX SPX? Apple used Apple Talk. So when you try to get a network working with all of those, you had every darn protocol known to man. Uh, when I first started my company, I was taking care of a company called Aerospace Reports. And the guy who referred them to me said, I got their network up and running, but I don't know what I'm doing. So I turned on everything. So I went out there and they said, yeah, it works, but it's ungodly slow. Well, he, remember the old um, Windows 95 ne network configuration area? He went in and added everything. He had every client. So he had client for Apple, client for Microsoft, client for Novell. He had every protocol. He said, I don't know what I'm doing, so I just turned them all on. What do you think? Is that a good idea? No. No. So I went in there to the owner's machine and started removing stuff. I mean, immediately, remove, remove. She said, what are you doing? I like, trust me, I'll, figure, I'll get this working. She's like, but you're deleting everything. Well, I got it down to the one protocol they needed, and it was so much faster. She's like, wow, it's amazing. You might know what you're talking about. So actually, way back then when NetBuoy was still around, NetBuoy is actually faster than TCP IP, believe it or not. And if we wanted a fast network, I would actually run NetBuoy internal, have TCP IP as well, but I would set what's called the binding order, which they don't talk about in here, but you could set the binding order with NetBuoy first. So what that means is it would try to communicate with NetBuoy, and internally it did. And then if we want to get on the internet, it would then use TCP IP. So yeah, they don't really stress that much anymore since we all use one protocol. But back when there was multiples, that was, it could really speed up networks that way. Okay, TCP IP is the most common, okay? TCP IP is a protocol suite, they call it, okay? It has IP and TCP, actually. IP is the internet protocol. One of these is connection-oriented. you know which one's connection-oriented? TCP or IP? What do you think? TCP. Correct. TCP is connection-oriented. IP is not. Think of IP like the idiot protocol. Okay. It, IP is like the addressing on the envelope. If I take an old envelope and put an address on it, that's IP. Does that guarantee it's going to get there? No, it's up to the postal service to read the address and deliver it correctly. That's TCP, okay? All right, so TCP establishes the connection, is in charge of the reliable delivery. So, you know, it's pretty much how it works. And there's our TCP model. What they did is they took the seven-layer OSI model and said, you know, application presentation and session layer all kind of work together. Like your email client will handle all three of those. So why have three separate layers when one application does all three? So they said, you know, let's have a four-layer model instead. And it works fine. We've had no problems. ICMP is ping. If you've never seen ping, I know you all have, but I'm going to show you anyway. You can say ping www.google.com. What I'm doing is I'm basically sending a request out to Google, hey, are you there? And they're replying, yes, I am. And you can see how long it takes to get there. You see the time to get there was 32 milliseconds. Now I'm going to ping my house. Okay. So it takes 34, 35, 36 milliseconds to get to my house. So it's farther away. Okay. Or I have slower equipment. We're just talking, you know, actually it is a lot farther away. So, But ICMP is one of the core protocols. But ICMP is one of those that's actually being disabled a lot lately. A couple of years ago, eBay, Yahoo, and all them got hit by not denial of service attacks. So a lot of places are blocking this. My school blocks it now. You cannot run ICMP internal to, I mean, you can't run it from inside going to outside anymore. You can in our labs, just not in the regular school area, okay? All right, there's different types, okay? You have the type, the code, the checksum, which is not overly important, but there's certain values, like three. Port unreachable means if I was trying to connect, I couldn't connect, okay? That's a big, big one there. Um, Let's see what else is there. Network unreachable is zero. Host unreachable is one. These are basically different error codes. So when someone sends a TCP or an ICP request, it comes back with specific error codes. Like three is the most popular. 
destination unreachable. Okay. Attacks that use it, network discovery. Basically, we use even net, uh, Nmap, we used earlier today, uses ICMP to determine if hosts are alive or not. Okay. Smurf attack, ICMP and redirect attack, ping of death. A ping of death is not really out anymore. And if you ever want to watch a really cheesy movie, um, um, it was called Warriors of the dot net. Warriors of the dot net. So Warriors of the net. Okay, and it's and we're not going to watch it here, but it's it's basically a movie that dun, 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 talks about the internet. I mean, they got package cruising. All, all his own. Uncaring routers and dangerous for worse. He's strong. He's TCP IP. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a it's kind of a cool it's about five minutes long. If you teach a network in class, they have to watch it. Yeah. And it has the dreaded ping of death. Because you see the packets and oh look, there's the dreaded ping of death. <laughs> what the dreaded ping of death was was a packet that was too large. So the machines would receive it and they would basically choke on it and die. So that's been fixed in updates since then, but it's called Warriors of the dot net. And it's kind of cool. So look at all these great movies you guys are getting to watch. Man, it's, it's amazing. All right. All right. Exactly. All right. SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol. Been around for a long time. I've used it a lot of places. You guys are still using it on your campus. It's normally used for management, hence the name management protocol. It's used to check the statistics. If I bring up another website here, if I go to mrtg.cyber.rose.edu, rose, do you ever wonder if Rose State's working okay? Just pick any link. They all go to the same place. That's the traffic level at Rose State right now. Okay, Not much traffic going on right now. Okay, so basically what I'm using, I'm using MRTG to query my router and see the amount of traffic. And it's not much. You can see there's times when we had some traffic. Looks like about 10, is the clock right on this? Uh, let's see, 217, it's off by one hour because I didn't update it for, for whatever. So basically this is about, looks like about 8, to 10, so that was probably 9 to 11. That was probably us using the Nmap system and everything when we did Nmap earlier. But it shows traffic, and you know, we were only using 680K, so we weren't even doing much of anything on the network. If you ever wonder if Rose State's dead, check this. <laughs> okay, but that's using SNMP. Three, three different versions of it. One sucked. Two was better, but still unsecure. Three is secure, but no one's implemented. Tell you, Actually, am I using three? I can't remember what I'm using right now. I, I really don't know. I must be using three because I have the ability to change my community strings. With SNMP, you have what's called community strings. It's basically where are you going to ask the data from? So you connect to the public community and it will tell you the results. But now you can rename them. I think mine's called Rose, RW, Rose, uh, whatever it is. I don't remember. But okay. But SNMP devices have agents that can install machines. You can install SNMP on printers, on computers, on anything. And you can query them for information about them. Okay? It's not used as much as it used to be because there's a lot of vulnerabilities with it. There's been a whole bunch of known vulnerabilities. Okay? Agents are password protected, but some people don't put them on there. And the password is known as the community string, like I mentioned. But one and two, the default was public. Most people wouldn't change it. Actually, I don't even know if you could change it, to tell you the truth. Three gave you the ability to change it. Was it introduced in 98? Yeah. So it says security vulnerabilities were present in one and two. Yeah, three came out in 98. It says using the passwords along with encryption. So they're better now. But let me, you guys here at this school are running one and two. No, you're running two. So if you're running two, I mean, dude, you're only 12, 15 years behind. <laughs> so. All right, DNS, domain name system. This is the one component that will kill your network. Okay, I'm serious. If you screw it up, I mean, obviously we're having issues here with it. But point is, in, 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 the, in the world, 
DNS is the one thing that if you screw up, you take down everything. DNS is actually 13 root servers. Okay? There was uh, some hackers a couple years ago took down 11 of the 13, and still we were fine. Took down 11 out of 13, the Internet still continued to function. What it is, it's named a number is what it is. If you type in www.google.com, where are you really going? Well, I'll show you. You're really going to, if I do NSLOOKUP, www.google.com. There you go. That's Google. Let me get rid of that. Now, watch this. As I do it each time, you notice the numbers change. See, they're in a different order. I don't know if you can see that, but the last digit's different. It's called round robin. That way, when a whole bunch of people hit Google, first guy gets this one, next guy gets the next one, next guy gets... That way, not everybody's hitting the same Google server. So what that tells us is for this location right here, there's five Google servers. And, you know, Google does use location-based stuff, so if you do this in California, you get totally different numbers. But that last digit rotates. See it going through. It's called round robin. Okay, kind of cool. But DNS is what manages all that. Okay, it's a ba database of names to numbers. Okay, all right. And they, they they start talking about it here. What happens when I want to surf the internet? First thing I do is I check. Do I have I ever been there before? I check my cache. If I haven't been there before, I say, okay, am I in charge of this place? Well, probably not. Then I ask my DNS server. And I say, hey. You know, Shalon, my DNS server, do you, are you in charge of Google? And you're like, nope, but I know who is. And you forward me on up the chain to the top level servers or the secondary level servers. And what ends up happening sooner or later, someone knows the answer and gets it to me. Okay. Depending on how they're configured, they can work better than others. Okay. Caching, there's a bunch. You can be forwarders, you can be caching only, you can be all kinds of different types of DNS servers. Okay. I have an entire presentation on that, too. I've, I've done this so much. I'll tell you, when I ran my business, DNS is, man, if I would misconfigure that, we're done. It would cause so many issues. And the problem with it is people cache that information. So you might connect to me, get the information. And if I tell you to cache it for eight days and I give you wrong information, guess what? For the next eight days, you're going to be using bogus information. So it's tough. Okay. Okay, can be DNS poisoning. We could be giving up wrong information. Someone could get in and change my tables, give up bogus numbers. Okay, Zone transfers, the way it used to be. What a zone transfer is, say Eric back there is in charge of Google.com. Say I'm going to be in charge of Google. I could transfer the zone from Eric to me. When I ran my ISP, that's what we always did. If I was taking over services for somebody else, I would do a zone transfer to pull their records from their current hosting company to me. And then I would contact them and say, hey, I'm taking, actually, we wouldn't even contact them. I would let the client take care of that. But I would pull the records with, via a zone transfer. I would update them to point to me. And then we're up and running. Nowadays, it's pretty much blocked. You wouldn't want that to happen. You, want some, you wouldn't want someone to be able to transfer. The problem is, say I'm in, char I'm the, in charge of this school right here. Okay. So if I was to do a zone transfer to this school, so for like Google maybe, okay? I did a zone transfer for Google and stored it on the DNS servers for this school, okay? Well, no big deal. Whenever you guys query Google from now on, you'd be asking me and I'd know all about it. I'd give you the information, we'd be fine. But if Google was to update their information, we wouldn't get the updated information. Whole point is DNS, it needs to be able to be updated. So, zone transfers. Okay, FTP file transfer protocol gives the ability to transfer files back and forth. It is a clear text protocol so kind of scary, <laughs> but it allows us to transfer files. We have SFTP, secure FTP, and also SCP, secure copy, which does it with security, just a lot of places don't implement it yet. Okay, It's kind of like, um, we, does anyone know what type of numbering system we use in the United States? Okay, yeah, but we use, we use the imperial system, the miles and all that. How many feet in a mile? 5,280 feet, okay? That's the stupidest thing in the world. Why are we doing 5,280? Why don't we have 1,000 or something, like a kilometer? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, the, the um, European system, 
So much better. Remember years ago when they were going to switch the United States to it? I mean, our speedometers even started having the kilometers and everything on it. Yeah, I spent seven years in Europe. It takes about a week. Then you are totally fine. You know all about it. You know how leaders work. It's so much easier. But we didn't do that. So we got this stupid 5,280 feet, 640 square, you know, whatever it is, an acre. And who come up with those stupid numbers? Point is, we're stuck with what we got, and we don't want to change. We don't want to change to something better. So we use FTP. We have better stuff out there, but we don't want to do it. Okay? It's like we have SNMP version 3, but people are still using 2. Okay? All right, you can use FTP via the command prompt, your web browser, clients, all kinds of different ways. You can also work in active mode or passive mode. Passive mode is your, rather than specifying the port, you're kind of letting them tell you what kind of port to use. It, not really much better, but here's FileZilla. Can be used to transfer files. If you want to see an example of transferring files, I'll show you one. I'm going to connect to FTP colon slash slash. So instead of HTTP, I'm putting FTP. FTP.nei.com. And there you go. I'm inside of McAfee's server, DNS server. So I could go in there and I could download the virus definitions. There they are. There's the S stats. I could go over. I could go into the. Actually, I, there's the enter. I could go into licensed. I could go into. Where's English? Oh, antivirus. Okay. I could go into the engines. I could go into the 4.0 engine. I could download the latest McAfee virus scan engine. This is all wide open. It's not secure at all. Okay. Oh, they had a Mac one in there. I didn't know that. So these are the latest uh, virus signatures? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right there. Virus definitions. Okay. And if I can do view details. Okay. This SDAT came out on the 20th of July, which is today, at 1014 a.m. So if you haven't updated your virus since 1014 a.m., you're out of date. Again, this is McAfee, so you have to be running McAfee. But it's just an example of using a web browser or basically Internet, you know, your Explorer, to do FTP. Okay? So you don't really need clients anymore. You can do it without them, but you could use clients as well. Clients do have benefits, though. But All right, let's continue on. All right. So, vulnerabilities does not use encryption. It's in clear text. If you were to log in with a username and password using FTP, which I showed yesterday during the ARP, the, the Kane demo, remember he logged in with FTP, we were able to see his username and password. So it's vulnerable to man in the middle attacks. It says secure uh, transmission over FTP, SFTP or FTPS is available, but again, no one uses it. I don't even think, let me see here, the client is not even installed on our computer. I mean, we're running Windows 7. You'd think they'd have the client on this machine by now. So, nope, it's not there. So I don't know. It's one of those things we're kind of stuck in the golden age, dark ages. Secure copy, mainly used with SSH, allows us to do a secure copy. It says enhanced version of remote copy. Works excellent, works on Linux-based systems. Not hard to use, it is a little different. IPv6, okay. Remember the old saying, 640K is enough for anybody? Yeah. Those of you that are old enough remember when computers first came out, 640K RAM was, oh, you'll never need more than that. <laughs> now we have yeah. gigs, yeah. okay. When IPv4 came out, I mean, I remember in building 230 on Tinker Air Force Base installing ThickNet, okay, which is the, it was called the golden, or the, whatever, the yellow garden hose. It was real thick Ethernet cable. You could have like one connection every 12 to 15 feet, no more than one connection per cable. I remember running that cable, and we're like, wow, why are we putting so much in here? We'll never use all this. I mean, now we got, what, 30 in this one little room. It's crazy. But back then, we didn't have that many. We didn't have that many at all. But IPv4, we're pretty much out of. It is gone. There are actually zero IP4 addresses left. It actually ran out over a year ago. But people just don't know about it. There was a if you if you went up on my Google Plus and read some of the articles on there, there was an article by somebody, some news channel, whatever. It came out about IPv6, and they says, Yes, the internet is out of addresses. We're switching to Internet 2. 
which is IPv6. Yeah. It says you must replace all of your equipment because once people start switching to Internet 2, it is not compatible whatsoever with Internet 1. It says replace all your equipment or you will be left in the dust. And I'm like, what? The whole point of IPv6 is it is 100% backwards compatible. I mean, yeah, we need to replace our equipment sooner or later, but I don't have to because it will still work with it, okay? IPv6, they say there's enough, the way it works is for each person right now, okay, you could actually have 50 octillion addresses. 50 octillion is like 50 with 50 zeros after it. Every person in the world could have that many addresses. Is that enough? There's, there's like enough addresses to put an IP address on every blade of grass. They say if you just take the planet Earth, break it into squares, one inch squares, including the moon, there'll be enough IP addresses to put one on every square inch of both planets. That's a lot of addresses. But now you also think back, 640K was plenty. So is this really plenty? I don't know. It might not be. I, don't, I, got, I use 20 or 30 addresses in my house alone. How many do y'all use? Now, really, externally, pri public addresses, I'm only using one. Well, if you, if you look at Star Trek and look at, uh, look at the board on Voyager. Oh, yeah. I mean, how many IP addresses? Yeah, they must have, have bazillions. Yes, they I know. Have, it's, they must have IP. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the board uses IPv12. Right. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but IPv6, excellent. Um, I do have an entire different... Um, presentation on this and if you go up to my WordPress site I have a class CIT 24032403 events networking concepts I have an IPv6 presentation I also gave it last time when I was here it's about an hour long maybe a little bit less Where but I 2403 yeah actually I'll show you where that is that so that way it'll be in this recording too if you go to wordpress.rosa.edu if you select 2403, that's my events concepts class. There's a video about DNS. Here's a video about IPv6. Oh, I don't know how long it is. Maybe I shouldn't have clicked on it. Oh, it's only 30 meg. There's. All I right. This is the continuation. Okay. Uh, actually, we should be on the next slide, but. Well, oh, this isn't the one. The rule to delete that one. This isn't the one. Is. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I need to get to a different video. Network programming, DHCP. Where's the other video? There it is, IPv6. There it is. I want to show you this here real quick. Yeah, but it's a. It's not very long. This is IPv6. This is the whole. I'm going to show you. Where's the number? It's kind of like, you know. There that's it is. the exact number. That's how many addresses each person on Earth could have. All 6.5 billion of us could have 50 octillion IP addresses. That's for every person. Look at that. Isn't that just... <laughs> I mean, but if you think about it, I mean, like, wow. you know, right, exactly. Cars have right. Addresses and, I mean, Actually, cars do now. They have cars that have live Internet now. So, right, but still, I don't but think <laughs> I'm going to ha quite have 50 octillion appliances in my house. Not quite. But still, I mean, if you think, okay, the way we're growing, soon we're going to run out of world anyway. But it's just amazing. But there, there's a video up there, IPv6, if you want to watch it. it I, I go through it pretty much, and it's ah, pretty interesting. Okay. All right, so IPv6, kind of cool. New one out there. Works great. They changed the headers a whole bunch. Look at it. They removed some stuff. Uh, like, the, see the top one up to the IPv4? They have header checksum. Everybody see that? The right-hand side, third row down, header checksum. Removed it. IPv6 no longer has a header checksum. So what the heck? Did everybody know what a checksum is to begin with? It's a error checking. So why did we remove checksum? Well, the point was... We had a header checksum, then a packet checksum. So we were actually having to recalculate every time. So why have both? The point was you were going to do one for the entire packet anyway. Why not just do one for the entire packet rather than the header and then the packet? It was like 
double the work. I'm just, I think when they wrote it, they just thought it was like a double check. They might have. It's kind of like um, electronic voting machines when you tell it to recalculate. You all see the video about that. I mean, when you recalculate an electronic voting machine, you get the same number anyway, as long as you didn't enter the data. But that's probably what they did. They probably said, well, you know, we want to make sure headers, are, headers correct first, and then we're going to check everything. Well, I can see maybe a header checks some and a data checks some, but they're doing header and then entire packet. So, I don't know. And, what, and the worst part was, they don't show it on here. Actually, they do. Third row down, left side, time to live. Okay, everybody see that? On IPv4, third row down, left, left side, time to live. So every time a packet's going cruising around the internet, every time it goes through a router, time to live is being recalculated. So it means every time it hits a router, the header checksum and packet checksum all needs to be redone. So that's twice as much. So why do it? So they said, you know what, let's get rid of that. They, they got rid of a couple other things as well. Okay. Well, I think when it was originally, you know, when a lot of it was originally made, when, uh, the reliability of the network was that's true. near as good either. Right. So yeah, that, that's true. definitely true. The reliability sucked way back when. It's a lot better now. But, it, but, you know, it is better. You can see it's a lot longer. The address is 128-bit compared to 32-bit now. Okay? All right. Has enhanced security, cryptographic, just wonderful protocol. They just tell you a couple little things you can read through there if you like. Okay? But what gets me is this is a new edition of a textbook, and we got four slides about IPv6. Think we need a little more? Yeah, that's why I made that other presentation. It's like, come on. <laughs> We really didn't quite, we, we got a taste, we got the appetizer, we didn't get the meat of it. That's why I made that other presentation. Okay, other principles is administering a security network can be challenging. Yes, very challenging, okay? Rule-based approach relies on the following procedures and rules. You know, kind of like we're filling out our travel paperwork. It has to be done a certain way. Are we happy with it? No, but we kind of have to live with it. <laughs> so it's one of those things, okay? Rules may be external or internal. It could be something by law. HIPAA, okay? We might be running a hospital network and we have to abide by a federal law, and that's just our internal policies, okay? So procedural rules dictate technical rules, okay? And this is a device security, network management, configuring a firewall, all those are to be the rules we're actually going to follow. Device security could be a secure router configuration. Anyone ever worked with an ACL on a router before? Yeah, quite a few of us should have at least seen them before. And they're can be quite complicated. I mean, I've worked on some for days and I can't get it to work for nothing. And then you find it's one little teeny typo somewhere. So it's, it could be tough sometimes. Okay? Flood guards, device logs, there's just a lot of stuff you should be doing to make sure your stuff is done correctly. Okay, okay it says routers operate at level three okay? because they you know, function across the network and the routers can also perform a security function. A Linksys router is a router. Works like a champ. I tell you, what, don't ever use the HP HPing three command doing a sin flood against the Linksys router. They'll be gone in seconds. Because I tried to do a project for one of my classes where I had the entire class, yeah, picking this router. Man, it lasted like not even a minute. So I'd reboot it. Oops, it's dead again. I reboot it. It's dead again. Now the Cisco router, it can handle it all day long. It got to the point where it was. I mean, not the Cisco Lynx this type. I mean, the regular Cisco router. I mean, I could hit it. See, HPing 3 could send out like 40,000 packets a second. And it got to the point where the network was unusable, but the router was still functioning. It was kind of being denial of service. Okay. All right. They talk about create a design, use a meaningful router name. Okay. Secure all ports. Now, speaking of router names, if I'm going to put a router in at my house, I'm going to put wireless network in my house. Should I call it Ken Dewey's Secure Network? <laughs> Probably not. You want to be a little bit, what's that word I'm thinking of? Obscure, Obscure at that point. <laughs> we, we call it operational security. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we need to put one of those. Is, we'll call this one the Master Nuclear Router or something. <laughs> operational security. Yeah, yeah. The FBI Safe House. Yeah, the FBI Safe House, exactly. <laughs> I actually watched the movie Safe House the other day. It wasn't too bad. But Denzel Washington was pretty good. Okay, secure all the ports on the router. Don't just secure some of them, secure all of them. So should we secure the internal port and external port? Yes, so we should. Okay, use a strong administrator password. Actually, the router on mine internal to my classroom 
has a very weak password, and the students know it. I do it because we use it for demonstrations. I tell them, you screw it up, guess what? You have no internet until it's fixed. Again, it's used for demonstration. It's not a, you know, kind of like testing our code on production networks. So, all right. Make changes from the console. Um, in the past, uh, when I ran my ISP, some days I would be at work at Rose State and want to edit my firewall. I made this mistake once. Don't ever change an ACL remotely from the device. I was actually connected to the device changing the ACL because the moment I, I pulled off the ACL, I was off. Cut my connection off, and I'm sitting at Rose State. And I'm like, great, now I can't connect. So I had to drive home real quick with all my clients. Can the entire network went down? Yeah, I know. I'm an idiot. But the way to do it is connect remotely into an internal machine and then edit from the internal machine. Yeah, I still got cut off, but at least the internal machine was able to save the configuration that I could just reconnect. So it's just issues. Make changes from the console, not remotely. Okay. Here's a picture of a router. Wow, nice. Okay. <laughs> Send flood. It takes advantage of a procedure for initiating a session. I basically make two-way of the three-way handshake. Okay. We can have flood guard, which prevents against that. All the newer devices will, should support this. Okay. Firewalls, IDS is normally support this stuff now. Look at your logs. Analyze your logs all the time. Do them frequently. Okay. And there's a lot of tools that you should be using because you really can't look at them yourself. There's too much stuff to look at. Okay. We have um, uh, network intrusion detection system logs, DNS log, proxy logs. There's tons of logs out there. Okay. I just talk some of the stuff that can be in logs. We're going to skip that. Here's another logging system. Here's another firewall log. We're not going to look at those. Okay. What should we be looking at? The address is rejected and dropped. So in other words, who's trying to get into our network? Okay. Okay. Probes of ports. Now, I was in uh, Colorado teaching some class. I forget what it was. And we were running Nmap against our schools. We had everybody in the class. They were each running Nmap against their school. Okay, so I don't know, I had uh, Lawton, I had all kinds of different schools. Somebody, um, one of the students from Lawton, Pedro Garcia, ran it against his school, Cameron University in Lawton. I ran it against Rose State, and we all did it in separate schools. Lawton contacted OneNet and said, someone's scanning our network from your network. Oh, wow. So then OneNet contacted Rose State, who then contacted me. And I said, yes, that's true. We did scan Lawton, but I also scanned Rose State, and you didn't even notice it. Never heard another word. Because I did the exact same thing. I was scanning Rose, he was scanning Lawton. And yeah, Lawton said, I'm just good. We, would, we did not do anything wrong. We just did an external NMAP scanner, just like we did a few minutes ago in here. And Lawton detected it. It said, someone at Rose State, or at one that, is scanning our network. You thought that, well, obviously the person from Lawton didn't know that they were going to be paying that much attention. Or yeah, exactly. Like prompted emails right. and, hey. But it was kind of cool that they found it. Yeah. But when I told our guy, yes, that was us, we were doing it, and yes, I scanned Rose State as well, and no one noticed it. And what about the other schools? No one ever said a word. No other school said anything. Not, Not even Rose State said anything. Yeah. Yeah. So it's. I just thought it was funny that they were <laughs> telling me about it, but oh well. That's life. So, all right. Other things you can track is unsuccessful logins. They mentioned here called source routed packets. Okay. What a source routed packet is is when you tell the packet how to get there. It's kind of like Melissa telling us how to get from the hotel to here. Okay. Now that would be a source routed trip. Now, me, I did the dynamic routing. I tried to follow my GPS. This is the worst place for GPS <laughs> because every road's been replaced. Yeah. We were looking at yesterday, the day before, the necessary road, which is blocked <laughs> off. <laughs> the necessary road has been closed. Now it's been renamed to the no longer necessary road. <laughs> yes. I just thought that was pretty funny. But uh, okay, so source routing is when the packets know how to get there. You know. Is that like MPLS? Yeah, someone close to that, yeah. Um, you can also think of it, you ever see someone who 
won't take your advice. I know better. It's kind of like the source writer packet. He knows better. But sometimes the road, I told you, you know, you should have listened to me. That kind of stuff. Okay. All right. It says growing networks may need reconfiguration. Yeah, we're always adding stuff. Always adding. Okay. Network separation, they talk about keeping stuff separate, maybe segmenting them out, maybe keep our servers. Yeah. Should we really allow the entire school to be able to connect into the database server? Probably not. I don't know how Rose is configured, but I bet I could. I bet if I brought up my SQL management console, I bet I could query and find the server. Hopefully there's a password on it. <laughs> I haven't checked, but okay. Okay, we could have air gap switching was you really want to keep stuff separated. And if you if you read up about the, the Stuxnet virus, you'll learn about the air gap and how they got that one all figured, but we're not going in there now. All right. All right, they have a picture in here which we're not going to go through, but they're just talking about ways to separate out your network. You can look at the pictures later. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, it's actually the same thing. VLAN, virtual LAN management. We talked about VLANs in the last chapter, but they need to be configured, obviously. They need to be changed. They need to be monitored, logged, okay, all that kind of stuff. So they should not communicate with other VLANs unless they're both connected to a router. They should still be, they should be functioning like external networks, a okay, separate network, okay? It says configure empty switch ports to unused VLANs, Okay. So what they're talking about is on your switch, actually this is one thing we did at Rose State when Brad Johnson took over. Um, he went through our network, found which ports were being used, and unhooked the cables of the ones that weren't being used. Because they literally had patch cords plugged in for every single port. So he went through, and if it wasn't being used, he unplugged it. Was that a good idea? Yeah. Sure it is. And then he went into the switch and turned off every port that wasn't being used. So that way, if someone just happened to walk into there and plug something in, it's not going to work. So he kind of did double protection, which was amazing. I mean, that our school's been in business since 1972, and he did this last year. So, yeah, it was funny. I'm glad he did. But it's something we should have, you know, I'm not, don't take, take care of our network, but I was impressed when he did that. I mean, when they first hired him, they were very skeptical. Now, they're like, oh, my God, he's a genius. He's in charge of everything. Yeah, you can do whatever he wants. Because he does. He's good. He has good ideas. All right. Okay, it says configure switch ports to pass tag VPNs to explicitly forward specify tags. Okay, that's I'm not covering too much more about that. Port security is turn off ports not required, which we just talked about that. Let's see. All ports should be secured before switch is deployed. In other words, the port should either be in use or turned off. Okay. It says network administrator should issue shutdown command to each unused port. That's just what we talked about. Just talked about that. Mac filtering. This is filtering limit the number of media access or Mac addresses allowed on a port. So in other words, you're really looking what's on the other end. Because, okay, um, Eric back there has got his laptop. Okay. Eric probably plugged into the cable going into the wall. So if they were doing Mac filtering, they would have said, whoa, that is not the correct Mac address on this cable. Should have chopped it off. Okay. But does anyone do that? No. Yeah, Eric does it. Yeah, it's your work, but not here. Yeah, I mean, here, again, we're not very, this is not a top secret, you know, secure network running nuclear weapons either. Well, we even do it on our own classified network, though. Well, that's cool. We do. I, I mean, it's like that, too. It's identified by. You do that at your place, too? Yeah, so the student plugs into the laptop, they can't get on. Hmm. The only thing they can use is the wireless. That's actually a very good idea. I don't think we do that. We might. Okay, again, I don't know everything we do, but it's actually a good idea. All right. All right, let's go on. Um, 802.11, okay, Eight, or 1x, okay. Uh, this is a standard that provides the highest degree of security. It says block all traffic on a port-by-port -port basis, okay. We kind of talked about that already, okay. So step one, uh, someone tries to join your network, your authentication asks they would verify the identity, they send the identity, step four, that passes it over to the authentication server, it comes back and verifies the authenticity or identity, and then they're allowed to join it. So they're really checking who you are for each port. Kind of a cool idea. Virtualization, are we all starting to do more and more of that? Yes. Every, all we hear about now is cloud computing, virtualization, cloud computing, virtualization. So that's a really big deal. Managing and presenting computer resources without regards to physical layout. Can all be virtual now, okay? I use virtualization on my laptop running VMware Fusion. 
I'm assuming other people do as well. That's, and we're using this classroom. We have the um, not VMware install. We have VMware install. We run virtual machines. Now you can run three and four machines on one, which is kind of handy. Does anyone remember back when we didn't have that? I mean, we had it where every student had, you know, we had some that had multiple hard drives. They had one for Windows, one for this, one for that. That was tough. Nowadays, it's all virtual. I mean, it's so much easier now. You can install an OS without screwing up your original PC. We used to have it where students would actually format the PC in the classroom and do it reinstall. Guess what happened if they screwed it up or didn't finish it was the class right after you? They didn't have a computer. <laughs> We've had that happen many a time. So virtualization is very nice. All right. We can virtualize the operating system. Advantages, we're saving money. Uh, OU, um, I mean, it was about a year ago, I was talking to somebody there. They were virtualizing large portions of their network. Actually, Rose State did this as well. They were virtualizing major amount of servers. Because think about it. If I'm going to buy 10 small servers or one big server that can run 10 on it, much cheaper. You're saving money in air conditioning. You're saving storage space. I mean, rack space. You're saving so much stuff. Okay. Uh, I was touring DISA. Uh, Defense Information Security Agency, which is at Tinker Air Force Base. At least I was, that's when I was touring. They have a, a computer room. It's awesome. It is like an opera. It's white. It's perfectly clean. They got, you know, the removable floor everywhere. And it's super cool. And they got windows way up top so you can look down into it. Well, the room is huge. Imagine this room here. But the only computers we see are on the back table in the corner. That's it. The rest of the room is empty. When they first started doing computer support, the entire room was full. They got the point there's so much virtualization going on. Now they're running more clients back on that one little table than they did inside of the entire room. It's kind of amazing. If you ever get a chance to tour that place, it's really cool. Okay. Actually, well, once when the visiting team was here, we went and visited it. You probably weren't in CSEC then, were you? It was last year. Uh, yeah. Are we ever having another visiting committee, by the way? Well, yes, Cheryl's supposed to be sending that out this next week. Nice. Uh, Dr. Shimoy, trying to find out. When? When and where and how? This and fall, I think. This fall? Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure where. I need to make sure I schedule vacation for then. <laughs> yeah, but doesn't, like, Missouri, one or two people go? There's two of us. Okay, but isn't that all that go from your state? Where he normally wants everybody from Oklahoma to go. It's like, what the heck? Um, it's not... Cheryl. Cheryl. Yeah. Well, he wants you to go. It's not fair. I don't want to go all the time. <laughs> I know. I don't want to go all the time. I don't want to go. All right, let's continue. Advantage of penetration testing can be formed using simulated network environment. Now, one thing about that, I was actually doing a penetration testing class, and the student, one wanted to go above and beyond and really try to take their machine offline. They were trying to break into your class's machines. Okay. So one of the students basically said, I'm going to take their machine offline. So he starts hitting it with HPing 3, hitting it with thousands and thousands of packets. What he didn't think through was that it was actually a virtual server. By doing that, he took down the entire server. So he wasn't really taking down one machine. He took, so that's one drawback of virtualization. So if someone's hitting that one machine, they literally could take down many more. So I think it was Gene. Gene Madeline did it? In here. I forget which one. They're like, oh, I never even thought of that. I says, yeah, he took down the whole darn server. Oh, wow. And it was... That was who was that? It was It had to be Gene. You think it was Gene? I mean, he didn't do it to be malicious. Well, I mean, he was in my class. Too. Yeah, yeah. So this guy, he's, he was in my he's, class. He's really sharp. His, his right. <laughs> but it was, I think it was Gene. Maybe it wasn't. Probably. But he was trying to take the machine offline, which was fine. He just didn't think that, wait a minute, it was a virtual machine. Yeah. So if he takes that offline, he's taking all the other virtual machines offline. So it was kind of funny. All right. No, it wasn't him. It was Larry Stein. Yeah, you don't know him. It was Larry Stein, because Larry's real big on writing scripts to do stuff. And he wrote all these scripts on his virtual machine, and he said, go. Well, his virtual machine was obviously virtual. So when it was hitting the other machine, it took both offline, so he couldn't stop them. So I actually had to go to the console and take the server offline and you know, then kill his machine. Not only did I stop his machine, I literally deleted his machine. 
Because I didn't know if he had it set to auto restart. I said, you know what? Machine's gone. If you need another one, I'll give you a blank one. So, all right. I bet he got an ugly email. Yes. Yeah, we're going to do it different next time. <laughs> what? Did he get, I bet he got an ugly email. Yeah, he probably did. Yeah, well, he got a very ugly email. Just like the people that, like, let people run DHCP. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got involved in that one. Yeah. Well, I don't know who to send it to him. Like, crap, it's somebody. <laughs> oh. That's okay. That's okay. All right, so server virtualization relies on hypervisor software. V, uh, VMware can do that. ESX can do that. It's basically something. Microsoft um, Hyper-V can do that. There's all kinds of it. So this can reduce cost and energy use. So a lot of people think of cost as in hardware, but how about energy? When I ran my ISP in that building in my backyard, my electric bill in the summer was at least 400 bucks. Now, does that mean my servers are drawing that much power? Well, they were drawing quite a bit, but I had to cool it. And the more machines you got, the hotter they get. Uh, and it was basically that room, I had no heat in it. And even in the wintertime, that room never got below 60-something. Never. Because they're, they're generating so much heat. And in the summertime, then you have to cool it. And it was, uh, it was fun. Okay. All right. Can also help user, it says, can help provide users uninterrupted service. Because you're actually running better equipment. And it actually works really well. Okay. All right, security concerns says physical firewalls may not be able to inspect and filter it because it actually could be coming from multiple servers, okay? All right, it says, uh, says security must be in place to accommodate live uh, migration. I was moving stuff. A lot of these virtual servers move back and forth. Our system has four servers running hundreds of hosts on them, or four hosts running hundreds of virtual servers, and they move back and forth. Okay, so we must be able to support that. Okay, virtual machines need protection from their own virtual machines running, from other virtual machines running, because if you have one virtual machine, you can literally take down another virtual machine. And if that's true, are they ever hitting the external firewall? No, they're all internal, so need that as well. Okay. All right, IP telephony or voice over IP is the big thing now. Okay, voice and data over a single network. When I installed the network for Aerospace Reports at their new building, they had me install a voice and data network. And it was funny. We get it all built. They never did use the voice network because they did voice over IP. But I tell you, the good thing is the wire, I ran the same wires. I ran Cat5 wires. So the good thing is now you had an extra set of wire at each location that if you need one. But they never did because they did voice over IP. So, yeah, I can use the same wiring. So, like, you guys, didn't you have, like, Cat 2 here, you said, or something, Brian? Cat 2? There's three in this room. Cat 3 in this room? Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. But when I moved on to Tinker, uh, when I moved into base housing, they put me in an apartment that was having issues with the phone. Well, we checked out. They actually had wire. They went from outside the house to each jack. It was, like, one big, long daisy wire that was just, it was, literally, the wire was just loose. So you have multiple pairs going from this jack up through the wall to the next jack, up through the wall to the next jack. It was the weirdest wiring scheme I've ever seen. It was real thick copper, too. It wasn't, you know, the, the stranded now. It was bizarre. Okay. So some of the advantages, first of all, what is IP? It's voice and data on the same network. Okay, so the incoming calls can be selectively forwarded or blocked. A lot of good stuff about it. Okay. Cost savings, that's the biggie. It's a lot cheaper. You don't, and we were talking about that earlier at break. You can save big bucks by using it. Okay? So this is managing a single network for all applications, reducing wiring cost, excuse me, increased productivity, a lot of stuff for it. Okay? Cloud computing, pay per use. Now you only have to pay for what you get. You don't have to buy that whole entire server. Somebody did uh, some looking at um, cloud computing, and they were talking about, you know, the cost compared with getting your own servers. Yeah, you're paying quite a bit per person or per seat, but you don't have to buy the hardware. And yeah, go ahead. Yeah, along that line, I think uh, I, in my students did a project and I encouraged them to include cloud computing solutions in it. Right. And it was for an email service, upgrading an email service, buying it from Microsoft. Right. It cost, it, it cost uh, 
a, a certain amount, but then if you were going to upgrade the email server because it required an SQL server and all these right. pieces of hardware, right. it was like a hundred thousand dollars upfront cost on the hardware. Right. While you could bring up a cloud, cloud solution from Microsoft for a lot cheaper. Yeah, a lot cheaper. Um, back when I did my system, I had uh, I had QuickBooks. I know you said you use QuickBooks back there. Well, I used to buy QuickBooks every about every other year. I would upgrade my version of QuickBooks. Okay, which is my accounting software. Well, then they came out with QuickBooks Online. I loved it. It cost about the same. I, I figured out the cost of buying QuickBooks Online each month, and I figured about upgrading every two years. And it was right about the same cost. But the good thing was I didn't have to install the software. They supplied the backups. They supplied all the hardware behind it. And I could be out at a client's location, bring up the computer, enter the invoice right there, and hit print while I was at their desk. So a lot of benefits from cloud computing. You can access it from anywhere. I mean, think about it. Google Drive and Dropbox, I put the files, when I got done recording yesterday, I put them on this computer. I got back to the hotel. They were already transferred up to Dropbox. I transferred them down to my Rose State computer and deleted them. So I got six gigs of data transferred to my Rose State computer without using anything. That's all done through cloud services, OK? says it may revolutionize computing. I don't think there's a may involved anymore. It will. Okay. Okay. It says, unlike hosted services, it does not require long-term contacts. You normally pay for what you get. And the thing is, a lot of them offer, like, for personal use, come on, Gmail, it's seven gigs of space, Dropbox, all them. You know, it's pretty cool. Okay. You could have software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. So there's all kinds of new stuff, and they really don't go into it too much in here either, but more and more places are starting to go this way, okay? Some challenges. The provider must guarantee means to approve authorized users and deny imposters. So how are they handling that authentication, okay? Transmission from the cloud must be protected. In other words, must be secured in some way, and the data must be isolated from one another. I don't want my competitor to be on the same service and then being able to access my stuff. Okay. All right, that's the end of this chapter. Stop this.